It's a hundred years since Prince Borghese and four other drivers raced 8,000 miles from China to France, and we are with 130 antique cars trying to do it again. Their owners have paid 35,000 pounds each to enter, and the race stops every night like the Tour de France. We're following five video diarists. There are the Itala boys, their car's a load of trouble, but Adam and Jonathan would sooner laugh than cry. The Geordie lads, Joe is a television chef and Bob has a pub. He bought the pub after being banned from it. There are the Aussies, Andrew invited his dad to drive him to Paris and here they are. There are the two fast ladies, Pamela likes the accelerator, Nicola prefers the brake. And there's baby driver, Petite Michelle from Manhattan. She's with Dan from the Midwest. Michelle's the driver and that's the way she likes it. And I'm Jack Pitsy and I'm on the race trying to understand what's going on. In a Chinese town on the border of Mongolia, the Peking racers are waking up to the fourth day of their journey. Well, good morning. This is Mini Me from Car 115. And this is Andrew from the FC Holden. Both and of which are the same. That's right. We just had a very comfortable night. Very, very comfortable compared to last night. A decent sleep and Dad was sounding like a backfiring chainsaw all night. Well, so you can work that there one out you go. Behind me you can see the train station with lots of goods trains going through it. And there's the hooters that have kept me and Pamela awake all night. Even earplugs did not stop the loud horns. So we are incredibly tired this morning, but um, we're going on. Pan into the, uh, the courtyards and uh, let the people know how, uh, how tidy they are, how modern, There's a fire over there at my two o'clock in the middle of the road, well, on the footpath. Where those new buildings are. A couple of workmen there on the on the job site. On the job site. You see they've got their safety gear on. And look at this, we've got some coal or tan bark or something or other. It's fairly well loaded, he's got uh Extendable sides on that truck. Yeah. Very unique. I think this is where they live, and I really think it's pretty shocking. Um, I've just watched somebody hang their washing out, and they're living in such abject poverty. It's just incredible. You should have been at the briefing. Were you not at the briefing? I know. You don't know to go, need to go to the briefing because you are a walking encyclopedia. Okay, and so, you so what done. happened at the briefing then? Well, you don't need to know. You know what happened in the briefing. You didn't go because you already know what happened. <laughs> How would I know what happened at the briefing well, if I didn't go? Well, everybody was there apart from you, but you didn't need to go. Obviously. What happened then? What, 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 well, what? you don't need to know because it's already in your brain. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so this is just another little <laughs> argument about the argument. briefing. It's, it's not, not an argument. argument. Look, can you look at the camera, please? It's a discussion. I'm looking All right. At the OK, you look very good. So you've been to the briefing. And no, no, we, we've all been to the briefing. Okay. Everybody on the rally. Can you talk in sound bites, please? Everybody on the rally has been to the briefing. Okay. Have they not? Yeah. Have they? Well, I didn't go. No, didn't you? <laughs> didn't you? Why not? Because you were there. <laughs> no, everybody was there. Downstairs, the crowd has never seen anything like the cars, and Dan from the USA has never seen anything like their town. Dan's never been out of America before. Not being a world traveler myself, except for this first time, I am amazingly impressed by everything that's going on. Now, other people don't seem quite so impressed, but um, I don't know, I guess it's first time uh, wide-eyed wonder on my part. And, uh, great time. I am just enjoying the hell out of this. And to my dear wife, thank you, thank you, thank you very much for, uh, for agreeing with, with me on uh, allowing me to go on this trip. And I do love you, Susan. The rally director is down early, about to herd his flock out of China. 10% of the rally have got troubles, and once you go into Mongolia, you can't get back very easily. You can't go on a truck, you can't get your car out, you can't fly back in, we don't have visas. So it's make or break point. Mongolia today? Yes, and yes. no turning back? 
No. Um, if our cars, we were told that if our, we felt our cars weren't up to it, that this is the point where we called a halt. Um, we had to be confident that our car was going to make it. The Geordie lads have been in a local garage for some last minute preparation for whatever lies ahead. We'd like to say thank you very much to your mum and dad for helping us to fix our car. Because we've come a long way and we're going, we're hopefully we're going to go to Paris. Okay? What's your name again? My name is Fenton. Say hello, Ava Rose, to my, to my little daughter. Yeah? Say hello, Ava Rose. Hello, hello Ava Rose. Hello. Cheerful coloured arches mark the frontier with Mongolia. Here it is. The whole queue is moving up en masse. Uh, I've never seen this much... I don't know what you would call it. It's just an amazing collection of vintage cars and, and people. And, and we're invading Mongolia. The rally director's partner, Heidi, is counting the cars. She's in charge of hotels and camps. We've dropped um, one car, car 49. And um, that's it, as far as I know, we're taking everyone through. How does that square with your plans for hotel rooms? I expected that. I'm not expecting to take every car into Russia. Oh. That, that's what we, we assumed would happen. We would drop five to ten cars in Mongolia. And they will have to go back to Ulaanbaatar. They can't come forward with me. They have to go back. To, that's the only place they can ship from, ship home from Ulaan. Your partner Heidi has just told us that the numbers are about what you expected. Yeah, just about everybody's going out and I just think it's incredible. It's not what we expected really because in hand on heart I thought we might lose 10. And I think it's all down to preparation and it's just extraordinary that we've patched them up and kept them going and they've patched themselves up and kept themselves going and I am surprised we kept virtually a full, full deck of cards. Bob of the Geordie Lads Lagonda spent last night on the town with a policeman. This guy is the best guy in town because when we needed money, he got money for us. When I needed to go and find something, he found it for me, he took me there. He maybe, maybe me. next time you can yeah. get to me, okay? okay We've next. been looked after very, very well. Okay. Tuesday. And thank you. Yeah, and we'll yeah. see you next time. What was it like last night then, Bob? Do you have a, Great. Oh, a, good night. a nice introduction to the city? Yeah, it was lovely, actually. Went to a few bars and yeah, stuff, and everybody was friendly as ever. We had a few drinks and spoke to a few locals, and they were very friendly and made me feel really at home. And Jim was fantastic. I mean, he just treated me like his brother. I only just met him in the afternoon. I thought the police were going to kick hell out of us instead of, the, instead of that. They love us to death. And it's mm. brilliant. <laughs> So how do you feel about the rest of the trip today then? Well, I'm a bit apprehensive because I think this is going to be probably one of the, the most um, trying days to date of the event. And we were looking at the uh, route no notes and we've basically got, I think about, is it 200 kilometres of sand and dirt? 200 kilometres we're going to do off-road, which is uh, a mixture of sand, rocky, craggy passes, narrow tracks, probably a bit hilly here and there. Are you nervous rocky, at all? Sandy, could get bogged down. Millions of things going through my mind. Nervous at all? Tiny little bit, tiny. The Aussies of car 115 are raring to go because they've caught sight of a certain Mongolian official. Andrew, we've got to tell them about the really good-looking Mongolian border guard. She was hot. She was hot. She was uh, all dressed up in a tunic and a very short miniskirt, large Russian-style flat cap, and she was hot. And she would have been hotter without her uniform. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> The Gobi Desert is just over the horizon now, and our cars are going to be the first to race there since Prince Borghese a hundred years ago. Dan is wondering if his little Chevrolet is really up to it. He shares this with his driver, Michelle. I've talked to several people that have no objections to going out early as a, uh, as a group. Yeah. Which, through the wilds <laughs> of Mongolia, may not be a bad idea. Uh, you definitely have a more competitive spirit than me. Uh, I'd, I'd just be very happy to make it. I don't, I don't even need to make it to Paris. Reims, you don't? No. I do, Reims, <laughs> actually. Reims is far enough. Champagne country will suit me no. just fine. <laughs> no, I am not okay with that. I don't think the shopping in Reims is as good as Paris. Oh. We are making it to Paris. <laughs>
But before anyone goes shopping, they have to get across this. One of the world's most notorious big nowheres, the Gobi Desert. A hundred years ago, this must have been a scary place for the original Peking to Paris racers. When Prince Borghese and his four rivals drove into the Gobi Desert here, how did they navigate? There were no roads. It was no good following camel trails because they would just lead to the nearest well or the nearest camp. The local people were never thinking in terms of building roads across the country and out of it. So what did they do? This that I picked up is a good clue. It's a China, maybe porcelain electrical insulator, probably late Ming period. And the answer is there already was a complete line of telegraph poles and telegraph cable running right across the desert, a ready-made signpost. They've had three days in China with no racing allowed. Mongolia has no restrictions, so now they can get going. They've started at one minute intervals and they're racing towards the finishing line, but they don't know how many miles ahead it is. So they must go as fast as they dare and the road is like 10 billion speed bumps. Right now we're heading directly on track where we're going, which is, it looks like the middle of nowhere, which is basically where we're at. Here we are, Michelle. I love it. <laughs> this is worth the chance. This is the best. This is the best. She hasn't had this big of a grin on her face since I've ever met her, I think. Oh, this is my favorite. This is my favorite. Yesterday was the... Yesterday was the pits. Yeah, the sleepy road. That was dreadful. But this is the good stuff. Oh, I'm having so much fun. The hell of a fucking road, I'll tell you. Well, this is the beginning of the Gobi Desert. Yeah. It's extremely bouncy, rutted, and there is no road as such. It'd be better if it's soft sand like this. But basically, just got uh, this is not too bad. A combination like hard, gritty dirt, stony dirt. The last 20 kilometers now, on what is effectively just sand. If we're lost, like I said, we're, we're in the group of other people who are lost. We've taken a little shortcut called deviation. That's where we should be over there. Right the way over there. How the hell we're going to get there, I do not know. All we've got is a track in front of us which just seems to go on for infinity, and we don't even know which direction it goes into because we don't have a map. So we've got the GPS, and we're gonna hope we can somehow or other hook back up again. We could always turn around and go back, Joe. But there's definitely, there's vehicles moving on that road over there. So? And the GPS is saying we're slightly off track. I think we're about two, we should be about two K that way, two kilometers that way towards the telegraph pole. So we're back so we're still parallel with the railway line. Yeah. I think okay. this road looks like, just from what I can see with the binoculars, it's swinging back round to the right, Bob. Even with telegraph poles and GPS systems, it's fairly easy to get lost. Here is the conflab of which way to turn. There was a fork back there about two kilometers away. We are um, with a Bentley, I think, yep. 
um, number 60. He went that way and decided to turn around. I think go back, go right. Okay. Yes. Because there is a road that way, there isn't is, there? Yes, yeah. The only point is when we went there, our indicator was pointing they were going the wrong way. But right. But they, these guys here in 130 have said that they went two kilometres that way and then they were two kilometres out. Yeah. yeah. So Judy, probably... Judy in the uh, Volvo is quite good. So she's coming back this way. Yeah. I think I think we are right to go back. As chairman, you're making a decision, we go that way. Yeah. Yes, we're going that way. The Geordie lads are back on track and all the wiser for their little deviation. It was a... Uh an education and a warning, so I think basically even if we're heading in the wrong direction we're going to stay on the dirt tracks and just use dirt tracks to get back onto the right track if we end up on the wrong track. Uh, so we fair old shit ourselves when we were in the air, uh, the sandy stuff because the car's very heavy. challenging to say the least. Corrugated dips, rocks, loose material, sand that can grab and snatch a car. Um, a lot of cars have been by the wayside as you can see up here. We're slowly moving up the field but that uh, that might be repaid back to us in spades later on. Bloody GPS people, we're not not fucking doing this by uh, by the root, root notes anymore. This is just full on. This is what we paid for, and uh, this is what's gonna. You can see what's happening. We're all over the place. We'll, I hope the stability control on the camera works because it certainly doesn't on the FC. Well, the sump guard works on this. That was an optional extra. The uh, stability control, we we opted not to take that. Uh, too many electronics involved. Just the bare bones, paddock basher. We're doing well, and uh, we'll catch you later. What do you think so far? No, oh, it's great. I love it. I love it. It's uh, different than uh, driving in Morocco with a modern car. Um, for one thing, I had brakes, uh, <laughs> which I don't know. Well, but, it, uh, it's got brakes that yeah. just don't work very well. Rather uncomfortable inside here yeah, with the dust and the grit. Lost what? Do you think we should, I think we should stop and check the headlight bulb now. It's flopping backwards and forwards. Just pull off the road a little bit. We'll have to, we need a spanner. Oh, we'll get a spanner. I've got my girl back to
They've gone as fast as they dare, not knowing whether the finish of this test would be after one mile or 50. And after 37 miles, that's 60 Ks, here it is. In 1930, Lagonda comes in, trying to keep the old engine cool. that some cars haven't got to the start yet, 37 miles back. There's going to be plenty of work for the mechanics on the service crews, like Tony Folks. The service crews are all before the test. Oh. Uh, we're 60 minutes, we're actually at the finish of the test here, as you know, 60 kilometres further on. Um, we'd, we've got a car just broken down about another three k's on. We're going to look at that now, and then we'll come back here and wait for some of the cars to come in and wait for a service car. To somebody come in. said there's an Aston Martin with the clutch gone. I, I think the Aston Martin with the clutch gone has just gone through. Oh. It's slipping, but it is drivable. He, he'll make it tonight, I'm sure. We'll change the clutch tomorrow. Just for a moment, turn back the clock to yesterday. Only 24 hours ago, the Atala boys were speeding along a tarmac road and feeling like a million dollars. They're just saying what a fantastic thing it is to be driving in Mongolia on a Tuesday morning and how we would not rather be doing anything else. But any minute now, that's all going to change and the Atala is going to let them down in the middle of the Gobi Desert. The official book of the Peking to Paris is out now, published by Veloci at $29.99. Check out PekingParis.com for further information.